Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Pacific Paranormal Podcast, a production of Pacific Paranormal Investigations. Tonight, tonight, we join PPI investigators Jason Siegman, Carl Sherlock, Deborah Page, Tim Mountain, and Brian Hoyle as they interview Edwin Becker, author of True Haunting, a first-person account of he and his wife Marshall's personal experiences in a haunted apartment building they bought in Chicago, Illinois in 1970. Hello everyone, this is Jason with Pacific Paranormal Investigations. Uh, with me are several other members of PPI. Hi, my name is Brian. Hi, my name is Deborah. Hi, my name is Tim. And I'm Carl Sherlock. And thanks for joining us for another in a series of podcasts devoted to the paranormal and the unexplained. With me on the phone tonight is Edwin Becker, an author, husband, father of two, and grandfather of four who currently lives in, lives in Missouri with his wife, Marsha. Uh, his books encompass a variety of topics related to the paranormal and to human experience. They include such titles as Banished, A Trip Back in Time, Death Walker, A Vampire's Vengeance, Famished, and 13 Chilling Tales. However, we're here to talk with Ed about one of his more recent books released just last year entitled A True Haunting. This book details a true account of Ed and his young family's paranormal experiences while living in a home they purchased in Chicago back in 1971. The experience has led to the first nationally televised attempted exorcism in U.S. history. Most recently, Ed and Marsha's experiences were presented in the season two finale of Sci-Fi Network's popular series, Paranormal Witness. What's fascinating is that Ed and Marsha's experiences have not been well known until recently. It turns out there was a reason for this. Ed and his family had not shared their story with the public until recently, in part because of fear of public ridicule. However, Ed and Marsha have documented their experiences in a book that they intended to share only with their family. Ed and Marsha's grandchildren encouraged them to publish their story, a story which can now be read in A True Haunting. Those same grown grandchildren have convinced Ed and Marsha to eventually share their experiences on Paranormal Witness. Since then, Ed has dedicated himself to the very public duty of both sharing his story and also communicating with and helping others who have had similar experiences. Ed, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. You know, first, I want to help those listeners that have heard your story get a little bit of a background of what you're talking about. Uh, let's go back in time now. It's 1971, you and Marsha are recently married, and Marsha is expecting your first child. So you go out and do what most young couples with a growing family do. You go out and buy a home. So you find a home that's in your price range, and uh, if I understand, it was a home that was built around 1900. Does that sound right? Correct. And it's in a very old and historic area of Chicago. When you first inspected this house, did you have any idea that this was no ordinary house? Well, there's two things. So one was we were desperate. So it wasn't like I could uh, go out and pick out any house I could afford. We were being evicted because of having a child. And I, what I found was an air estate, which kind of told me that it would, it would be easier to negotiate. And no, I had no idea when I walked into it. You have to understand my background a bit and that I, I was an abused child. I bounced back and forth between my parents. I spent some time in an orphanage. And I spent a lot of time on the road as a professional musician as I met my wife. So I did not know what a quote-unquote home really felt like. And when I did the walkthrough, I uh, felt a number of sensations. I did not know how to interpret those sensations. And in fact, some of them I thought were positive. When I entered a room that was cooler on a hot July day, I thought, this is a good thing. You know, no air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear to God, that's exactly how I felt. And if I got a little bit of the chills, it, it, didn't, it didn't affect me whatsoever. I, I was a non-believer. You have to take yourself back to that time, and that ghosts were not a subject. In my day, I mean, ghosts were, I don't know if you've seen Topper, or the Canterville Ghost, uh -huh. or the yes. Ghost of Mrs. Muir, or Casper the Friendly Ghost. Yes. <laughs> those were the ghost icons that we had in those years. So I, uh, I had no belief, and I had no knowledge. You know, and I think that's a really good point, because obviously when you watch the program, they do a little creative editing with the spooky music and, and whatnot, and, you know... You watch that and you think, gosh, he should have known. <laughs> but obviously it really wasn't that obvious at the time. No, no. And I think, well, you fellas know probably way more than I do. The paranormal doesn't jump out at you in full strength. That's true. It, it typically starts with little subtleties and then works its way up. And that's exactly what happened uh, with this building. 
Could you describe your impressions? This is Brian. Um, could you describe your impressions the first time you stepped foot inside the property? My first impression was it was uh, in disrepair. It definitely needed outside painting and uh, there was paint peeling everywhere. Actually, I, uh, I was shocked when we stepped in because, uh, as paranormal witness did accurately, Myra jumped out at us and she used way more foul language than they used on the program. <laughs> I, I don't know how that could be, but... <laughs> And you had mentioned this both in the book and, and they mentioned this on the program that this home had only belonged to one family up to this point. Well, and I imagine that's not something that usually is on most people's checklist of things is, uh, you know, check check for a history of murders, check for history of paranormal activity. That's even even today. It's it's kind of hard to imagine that that many people even consider that going in, especially when when they would be in a similar situation that you're in. Now, your wife, she came to the conclusion that the house was haunted before you did. So what experience did you have that eventually made you come to the conclusion that you felt this house was haunted? I guess my first, I, I had a number of things that affected me when I was cleaning the basement. I, I would feel, I've got pretty good senses, and I would feel like I was being watched, and I would smell the distinct odor of burning wood, and I, I just found it to be something inexplicable, something I couldn't. I couldn't predict what it would happen. I, there was a pop belly so down there, and, and uh, now and then I'd get chills. But I was a non-believer. I wasn't looking. You know, I, I just wrote it all off as body feelings. I, I think my first real experience was with the bathtub. And uh, I would set my bath, and I'd go in the kitchen to have a cigarette and cup of coffee with my wife, and then come back, and the bathtub plug would be wrapped around the faucet. All the water would be drained out. Then it was the phone. But I didn't find out about the phone until the bill came because I thought my wife was giving me some BS. I'd be calling home, the phone would be busy all day. And every time she'd put it on the receiver, it would come off the receiver. And now, did that happen one time, or was that was that a regular occurrence that you had experienced? A regular occurrence. And so it became an occurrence that actually happened that we witnessed. So we actually saw the phone come off the receiver a number of times. You know, maybe it was my lack of knowledge and ignorance, uh, or, or just being a hot-headed person. It, it made me angry. So I... Much like in front of a witness, I did find the shed in the basement. I did find, uh, when, when I bought the house, the shed was, had a lock on it. So I thought, boy, I got a treasure. Whatever's in there is now mine. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping, boy, boxes of gold or something. <laughs> <laughs> So the, and we're talking about Ben Vadir, correct? Yeah, that's, that's a pseudonym. 
Oh, gotcha. Okay, so that wasn't the real last name then. No, in fact, the Vadir part was made up by Colonel Whitman. Gotcha. Yeah, because I didn't notice that in the book. No. They wanted a last name, and they actually took the name of a, a historical English family. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sure that historical <laughs> English family appreciates that. <laughs> I just know it's some of the, oh, with the production companies from London, so I thought it was some kind of inside joke. Yeah, that could be. We'll have to look that up. <laughs> I, I, I went with her. Uh, Devere? It's the... Yeah, it's related to debate, but I, the I I became angry. Uh, first, uh, you know, I, did, I didn't believe. Second, I went through denial, huge denial, because I didn't actually want to admit that I'm leaving my wife in a place where she could be threatened or frightened. I, I just didn't want to admit that to myself. And then when I did admit it, eventually, I, I mean, I wound up changing the drain in the bathtub to a trip lever, and that solved that problem for whatever reason. But eventually I did admit it, and it only took maybe four to five months for me to go from a non-believing person to what the hell am I dealing with. Now, you said you saw, at one, at least at one point, the telephone come off the hook. Could you describe that? Yeah, we had, it was a, in, in those years, it was a, a brand new, uh, they just came out with the princess phones. So if you can imagine what those princess phones used to look like, it wasn't the old rotary phone. The receiver was set on top of it, and it would just lift up and fall off. So you actually saw it actually separate itself from the phone and, and then just fall over. Yeah, and, and much like the door in the kitchen, they depicted that in turn on witness. Really, that was over time, but what we used to happen is that door was really a real sticky, overpainted door. No way that door should open by itself. And, it, of course, it would open by itself. And, and a lot of times our daughter would be sleeping, and when we were either had friends over and sitting in the kitchen or we were going to make some noise and close that door, and it would open. And I just took it with a grain of salt. It faced me in the least. It bothered my wife. And I, I eventually, you know, got angry and said, you know, you want to see the door stay closed? I'll try out and make the door stay closed. And I tied it. And the thing started rattling, and, and you could actually see the vibrations. And, uh, and then I cursed Ben at the same time. So I, I did everything wrong, I, I later learned. But my wife was upset. And she said, don't do that. She was right. I shouldn't have done that. And whether I was communicating with Ben or not, because you can't see him, I mean, I had a medium tell me that possibly what we had there was the original owners of the land that drove the previous family nuts. Oh, I see. So they were, so they were actually thinking it wasn't this Vadir family. It was, it was the people that there before them on the land. Yeah, and you know, 40 years later, when we filmed Paranormal Witness, that allowed us to have a reunion with Dan, Dan White, who was with Dave and, and Ellen in my book. I couldn't find it when I wrote what I wrote. He found me once the book was published. He read. He found the book and read it, and then realized he was in it. So he did paranormal witness with us. Well, we never knew. I, I treated him at arm's length as landlord tenant. Although we were friendly, uh, we weren't that friendly. I never knew what went on in his apartment. And once he told me about how his wife was tormented, they even had a dog, an Afghan, that lasted there about a week, which we never knew they had. That's why it's not in the book. He told me they had a dog, and, and it, it also jumped the fence and ran for the hills and, and reacted the same way ours did. But his wife went through some things that I can't even tell you about unless I get his permission, because I, I may add it to do future work. Mm -hmm. But she just lost her mind and uh, left him, and they divorced soon after, all of which Marsha and I never knew. When she, when he, when she left him, mm -hmm. we were told she went to see her mother. Well, once I heard his story in St. Louis at the filming, I realized... Myra was busy, busier than a loon. She tormented Dan's wife, who was the first tenant. It did a great number on my sister that lasted her for life. And then what I didn't put in the book was the, the next tenant, which was, a, I call her Mrs. Scott. She also had a problem. When the medium told me it could be a, the family prior that owned the land, it, it did make sense because there was a, a threat of madness that seemed to go through the first floor. When, when we heard Dan's story, Marsha and I were glad we were on the second floor. Uh, he has two chapters worth of activity, mm -hmm. much of which initially he blamed on me. He thought I was, uh, they didn't have us correct stature-wise. Dan's about five foot two, and I'm six foot three. So he, he describes me, he said, I thought you were this giant man that was aggravating me. <laughs> <laughs> Put his tools on the back porch and they'd be moved around or, or a screwdriver would be missing, and he thought I took it. He heard, door, he heard keys at the front door. He knew I was the landlord and I had keys. He thought I was coming in for no reason. Uh, so you were sort of like a giant, angry Mr. Roper landlord type who just was, 
was uh, just scary yeah, to him at that time. Yeah, I the arguing. We'd hear these voices. He thought it was Marsha and I, and we thought it was him and Diane. And we, you know, we finally put it together that what we were hearing was out on the back porch. With, it was a repetition. It was almost like a record being replayed every time we heard it, except for once when we heard crying in our living room that I could never duplicate. It was an anguish that I tried to get on tape. I had a Sony tape recorder, but no sooner than I hit record, it stopped. It was like it knew I was going to do it. And, uh, That's interesting. It was yeah. probably, even seeing the apparition didn't affect me like hearing that crying. It was such a level of anguish that, I mean, it touched my soul. It, 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 uh, my wife and I heard it. We were in bed, and uh, it was loud. It was horrible. <clears throat> now, you said you thought it was a different language? No, I, I said uh, it was the level of anguish. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, it, was, it was just, you know, I've seen people who were sad and crying and lost loved ones and things like that, but I've never heard anybody cry like that, like what we heard. Not my whole life. I can remember it clearly. Do you recall the time? It was in the morning. It was early in the morning. I'm going to guess that uh, if I slept late, I slept till 7, and it woke me up. So it was probably between 5 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, you obviously went through a whole range. I mean, you and Marsha both went through a whole range of emotions at this time. I mean, how would you describe all your, your level of fear uh, with these experiences? And if you experienced fear, what was it about this whole experience that frightened you the most? Probably the effect that it could have on my wife and, and daughter. Personally, I feel no fear. I, I don't really fear anything that's unreal uh, other than it, it doesn't frighten me in a true sense. I respect it today. It didn't, I didn't, it didn't scare me down. It made me angry, and I feared for my wife. I want to, especially it started playing with the utilities, electricity on and off, and turning gas on and off. Mm -hmm. The gas, yes. That worried me. Now, Ed, you described seeing um, a woman sitting on your uh, porch step when you would come home for lunch? Yeah, many, many times. And, and I, I want to say maybe half a dozen times I saw her and always dressed the same way. And in Chicago, in, in the neighborhood, we have apartment buildings. It's not unusual for an old person to walk to the store and then stop and sit on someone's stairs and take a rest and walk on. It, it's just common. And that's how I viewed her. But every time I'd go upstairs to ask Marsha who the old woman was, and we'd go to the front window to look out, she'd be gone. And after about two or three or four times, I started to really wonder, well, the, see, this is where people like yourselves today provide such a great service, because you start to question your own sanity, and you guys tend to validate people, and, and at least what it does is it gives them some emotional comfort to know that they're not going crazy. So I thought, you know, am I saying things, you know, until Marsha and I saw her together, we were at the top of the stairs, Marsha just kissed me goodbye, she came around there, and the old woman went to the bottom of the stairs. And she looked as solid as anybody I've ever seen in my life and looked straight at us. And then she walked beyond, behind this wall where there was an inlet to go to the first floor apartment. I did not hear the front door, outer door, open or close. And it was a very noisy door. So I knew she went into that apartment. And I first attributed it to being, her being a relative of Dan and his wife. Only later that day I got home and, and uh, Marcia said they don't know nothing about the old woman. You know, what I felt was really interesting when I when I read some of the comments you have on your website and, and in the book is how you mentioned that it affected you in a way that you'll even look at people today on the street and wonder if they're really there. No, absolutely. It affects you your whole life. I, like I said, I, I, we're driving down the highway here in the Ozark. There's a guy walking along the side of the road that just, you know, is, is between civilizations because you can go miles between shopping centers or, or population. I check my rearview mirror still to this day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
that's a, a very interesting part of your book was when you were describing cleaning out the first floor. I believe it was before your sister moved in. Correct. And seeing the woman in the wheelchair. How did you learn about the, uh, the estrangement between um, the mother and the son that lived there? That was my next door neighbor. He filled me in reluctantly. He, he wasn't real chatty. He, he, in fact, he spoke broken English and uh, was more interested in uh, actually in drank Southern Comfort. <laughs> <laughs> Do it to you every time. Well, he would offer me a shot at 10 o'clock in the morning and we'd sit by his boiler and he had a wood burning boiler and would act like a fireplace and we'd talk. talk. But there was this man that would walk past my, our building on the opposite side of the street and stare at the building. And I'm assuming it would be to and from work or to and from somewhere. And I finally asked Walter, I said, there's a guy that looks at our building all the time. He just stares at it. And he said that was one of the sons. And he believed that the falling out was that the, the older son wanted the second floor apartment. And because the younger son was married, the parents or the mother gave it to him. And he had a falling out and left. And he actually lived down the street. And almost that the block has probably a dozen houses of the same design. So he lived in a very similar house on the opposite side of the street about a half a block down. And he never spoke with his mother again, according to your neighbor? Exactly. He, uh, he left and they never spoke again. I thought it was very interesting in your book that you described the moment that you saw the woman in the wheelchair and you walked to the window and you saw the sun looking. He was, yeah, he was staring right at the building. And uh. so when he saw me... And, and you never saw the woman again on your step after that? No. No, in fact, the woman on the steps I never saw after we saw her at the base of the stairs within the building. Okay. And, but again, once I saw her at the base of the stairs, and once they told me she didn't belong to our tenants, and I found she didn't belong to any post houses in the neighborhood, that's when my mindset went to, I'm going to grab her. You know, if she's not real, either that or I'm, <laughs> or I'm going to get him, Brian. You know, so I, I didn't know if I would be grabbing the air or, or what would happen to me, but... I thought I was going crazy. I think that's a very interesting observation that you made because a lot of times in truly paranormal situations, people will disregard what they see because they think it's a solid living human being when in fact it's not. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, actually, you're absolutely correct. I, in fact, I talked to Dave Schrader and I told him, I said, if you were in the end of your office building and you see a guy walk across the hall at the far end, you make no assumptions that the ghost is solid, it walks across the hall. You know, it's the last thing we think of. And maybe it's just because we can't control these energies nor see them that we don't want to believe and we, we try to write it off being something that we can relate to. From reading your book, it sounds like the, the old woman or the apparition of the old woman was the, the most benevolent uh, energy in the building. Was there anything else uh, that happened in the building that you felt was non-threatening or maybe even loving, friendly, warm? There were, you know... I, like, I, I didn't find my bathtub incident threatening. I really didn't find the kitchen door threatening. When my wife went home, and in the book, I didn't, you know, I'll be honest with you, she actually left for a reason. She couldn't take it any longer, so she went home to help, and I was living by myself. It turned on my gas on something I was cooking on the stove, and that's when I started to, to worry about negative, real negative energies. The phone was an irritation. All the, uh, to me, in my, in my youth, and with my lack of education on the subject, paranormal wasn't even a word. I didn't ask people because they'd laugh and they'd really feel. Yes. It wasn't, you know, the negative energies, fortunately or unfortunately, for us, most of the negative energy I've found was actually on the first floor. So, Ed, if you had believed in the paranormal and ghosts from the, the get-go, do you think that you would have had more control of the situation or dealt with it any better? Definitely. How so? Yeah, definitely. Well, so I certainly wouldn't have antagonized it. I probably would have been more spiritual, which is basically what the exorcist and the psychic told mm -hmm. us to do, is to not to address it, number one, to start to realize. I mean, what happens with a, in a situation where you have to live with it is it does little things that you tend to blame each other for. So I would ask Marcia, you know, where'd you put my wallet? You know, why is it on the bed and not on the nightstand? And uh, eventually we were just snipping at each other. We went from a very loving couple and, 
meditating on and I, I had become a believer. So I, I warned them that this was one of my sister was excited about it. She was four years younger than I am. She was interested in that type of thing and Ouija boards and whatnot. Later I found out she was having seances and things and I went ballistic. But in that first floor apartment there was an argument. I mean when I watched the psychic and the exorcist, they argued over whether it was from the loved one spirit or a demonic entity. And I don't know to this day. But I knew there was a stronger negative energy on the first floor than there was on the second floor. <clears throat> that negative energy was concentrated primarily in one of the bedrooms? Yes. Yeah, it was one that you could you could feel. The first group of people, and there was no help in 1971, but I flippantly told Marsha when she said, what, what do we do? I said, look at the yellow pages, you know, sarcastically. And she did, and she found two people listed. <laughs> <laughs> found when you were cleaning out the basement? This wasn't a key that you carried with you on your person. It was hung up somewhere? Yeah, it, it would be hung up in the kitchen. Well, my wife left and it played with my keys a little bit, but it would be hung up in the kitchen and, and we had a little, like, a, a, a wooden thing shipped a key with hooks on it, and I'd hang my keys up there. And I'm a creature of habit. But then, you know, as I grew older, I realized that, you know, a man's Christ is his man cave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. Yes. you feel uncomfortable to be in there? No, it, it didn't. It, 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 I just had no desire to be there. It wasn't like the basement where there was a, a background discomfort. I sent something down there. And eventually I gave in to it and started to believe. Initially I didn't. Initially I thought it just gave me the heebie-jeebies because it was not the old basement. You know, mm-hmm. Once I cleaned it up and it was sparkling white and the floor was painted and, and I put bleach down the drains and it smelled nice and, and still I get the smell of burning wood. I would And of course, in those days, you didn't have like EMF meters to see if it was the wiring in the house that was making you feel that way. But there was just a sense of unease that followed you around. Yeah, and you know, I, I was a uh, a product of Chicago street. I feared people. I I, uh, I have a respect for the paranormal, and my house is filled with blessed items. And my wife and I, uh, now and then, especially around the holidays, we'll get visitors. It's not usual for my children to take pictures of me and have orbs. Picture. But I don't fear. Yeah, I, I, I fear people. 
Now, you had, you had mentioned earlier, and I can really relate to this because we hear this a lot in our investigations. We have a lot of people who approach us, and the reason why they approach our group is because they're looking for some form of sanity. They want us to, it's not that they want to be on TV, it's not that they want any recognition. They sound a lot like your experience. They just want someone to help them make sense of it. And now obviously the resources that are available today or, or are more numerous than they were in your day, but what kinds of things did you and Marsha do to try to help maintain your sanity uh, during those times? Well, Marsha, you know, and I selfishly wrote the book from my perspective. I really didn't interview her. In fact, as a man, as a husband, I felt like a failure. I couldn't protect her, so I, I didn't want to know what the hell went on during the daytime. But I knew she built a, a, uh, a fortress in the kitchen, which had a door to the enclosed back porch. She frequently left that door open. She had me buy her a little television that she walked in the kitchen. She did her wash in the kitchen, like a little Hoover roll-up roll, roll up that broke this thing. She'd bring the baby in the kitchen from the best that. She was always, you know, if you talk to her, she's always ready to leave. She felt some comfort when Dan moved in. She felt she could call for help, and she puts it. Myself, I didn't cope very well with anything. I, 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 I faced everything with just anger. I, I was aggressive and angry. Yeah, I tied the kitchen door shut, and I said, I'll fix you, you bastard, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you tried to do anything with a phone, like tied down the phone? No, I, I, I just did, we didn't. We didn't use the phone much. But number one, you paid for every single minute you were on the phone, whether it was local or long distance. There were no area codes in those days. You had a dial operator, and they charged a fortune. It cost something like, uh, in Chicago, it would cost something like 80 something dollars to have a jack installed. Oh, my gosh. Wow. You, know, so <laughs> you couldn't buy a phone in 1971. You could not buy a phone. You had a lease at the phone company. That's so right. The phone yeah, you paid a month lease that. charge for. Yeah. Uh, the phone wasn't something I, you know, unlike today, and I, I get people who write me emails, and they say, hey, man, why did you get some pictures on your iPod or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> provoking it. This um, was a few years before the Amityville Horror was released. Do you have any reaction to that book or that movie when it came out? be able to get some interest on that now if you if you want it but <laughs> <laughs> to 
as he'd get a manuscript in, in, in those days, you couldn't do a 14-page Kindle book like you can today. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, publishers wanted 60,000 words minimum. So if he got a good manuscript that was a good story and it was only, let's say, 44,000 words, he'd turn it over to me and say, yeah, give me some pages. And I'd read the book and I would do what I could to give him back 60,000 words. Well, he got in trouble with two publishers and they said uh, he promised them so many manuscripts he didn't have them. So he called me and said, do I have anything? And I said, well, I, got, I had this true haunting, but it wasn't called true haunting. Then. I said, definitely 60,000 words. He said, just give it to me. So I, I gave it to him and he, he turned it over to two nameless publishers that are still in business today, who both came back and they said they, they loved the voice, and the writing voice. They said, but the book is way too tame. They said, you know, can your, your guy have a little more memories? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he remembers maybe some blood coming out of the wall, <laughs> but the screaming skeleton coming out of the closet. And, mm-hmm. The glowing red pig eyes outside the window or something. And they told me it had no commercial value. <laughs> It's a very well-written book, Ed. It really is. I mean, all of us downloaded it on our Kindles. <laughs> yes. Now, is that an actual photograph of the front of the house? It's an actual. Interesting. So, yeah, the book wound up. What really got to me was uh, it went to number one in England and in Britain and UK for uh, almost all summer. It was started in June. And it's still anywhere because we're so clustered there on the top ten. It's anywhere from number one to number 15 at any given time of day. But the Brits love it. I didn't think it was that well written to be <laughs> in the UK. You know, I mean, the authors that come out of these, you know, I mean, they're the home of literature. But what one of them sent me was a quote from Samuel Coolridge that said, writing has to be plain to stimulate the imagination. Another one sent me one that said, Somerset Mom, who said, if you have a good story, who gives a damn how you write it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, obviously, I know this was this was a challenge to want to bring forward because, the as you noted, the public isn't always kind to you know people who've had these experiences. There tend to be critics, naysayers. Um, I, I can imagine how difficult it is. We we have a lot of people coming up to us who want investigations, who really want to keep everything very much on the down low because they're so nervous about sharing the experience. What was it for you that eventually got you to where you were willing to? you know, publish and, and share this story in, in a public forum where you knew that there would be people that would, could possibly criticize some of your experiences? I, I think my daughter, my, my youngest daughter, just said, you know, dad, fuck it up, publish this. And I'm, I, at that age now where, you know, basically I don't give a damn. I'm older. I, uh, if people don't believe it, I'm not out to make anyone a believer. And I certainly understand. I mean, I never wanted ridicule, so we kept it quiet. I mean, paranormal witness, they know. They, they came after me for two months, and it wasn't until the family heard about it, my daughter and my grandkids, and they said, Papa, you got to do sci-fi, you know, <laughs> ruin their life if I didn't do sci-fi. <laughs> well, as you said, they, uh, you rock now. Is that, what it, is that how they put it? Yeah, now we rock. I mean, Nana and Papa, uh, we can do no wrong. We're, 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 <laughs> but Paranormal Witness, we had this director, producer, director, Mark Lewis, who basically... I have some understanding of what actors go through now because he sat and interviewed me for, I actually spent two days in a chair and he was able to take me back. He knew the book better than I did and he also made assumptions he could read between the lines of that book. And he saw where I was pulling my punches. I pull my punches a lot on the, on the uh, amount of friction it caused between my wife and I. I pull my punches a lot, which they left out, thank God. 
probably know you do a test, I'm not sure. But a lot of times people just want to know that they're not going crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> and a lot of times they'll appreciate a, a rational explanation for some of the phenomena they experienced. Yeah, and if you, if you, I mean, today you have your cages and you can exact this, I don't even understand. But you can measure it, you can tell them, yes, you do have the energy here, you do have this, you do have that. And it just tells them that, okay, I'm not going crazy. I mean, I, I get emails from people and I've, I've gotten some stories, huge stories, that I ask the people if they want to you know, talk to paranormal witness. This sounds like something that other people might be interested in, but 99.9% .9 of them want no exposure. They don't want people calling them crazy, they don't, they don't want to be stigma. And that's the way the majority of our clients are. They don't want anybody to know. There's still that stigma that's attached. So it's really it's really great when people such as yourself who's been through something so severe are willing to uh, share your experiences because how else are we going to, as a, as a society, going to learn about this type of phenomenon unless people come forward and, and share that experience? So I thank you for that. So many people don't want to. They, they don't want to know, I guess. I guess not. Hey, if, if we could rewind just a little bit, you know, I'm kind of fascinated about the arguing you heard on the back porch. Right. Um, were you ever able to record that or discern any words that were being said? We could discern, you know, certain words. I mean, we would hear, we would hear son of a bitch a lot. But mainly it was, it was screaming. It was something we couldn't make out. And it was like man go. It was like a replay of a recording. And every time I would stick my head out, it would always come from the back porch. I'd stick my head out, it would stop. Whenever I'd hit my tape recorder, it would stop. Oh, so you did try to record it. Oh, yeah. It's like I've got the full recording of the exorcism. And there are sounds on there that were not happening during the exorcism. We never heard, including a child saying, Mama, I think, in the background. It sounds in the distance. And we're on the second floor, blocks from a school, and, and uh, we heard some knockings and some other sounds on this exorcism. I wish I could have, you know, if you check the YouTube video, at about one minute... I think someone told me one minute 40 or one minute 60. You'll see a doorway in the dining room, and you'll see a white, it looks like a woman's skirt or a drapery, start to enter that room and then back off. That was impossible. They, they captured something. They didn't even know it. Because mm -hmm. that doorway had a folding final door, so nothing could be hooked to the door. And it was 10 feet from a window or a wall. So whatever, and, and at that moment, I mean, I specifically remember at that moment because the cameraman had us all behind the camera. He wanted a clean shot of the dining room. So there was no people in that end of the house. NBC had taken, I don't know, 12 hours of footage. And, of course, they were looking for nothing. So Sci-Fi and uh, Paranormal Witness tried to get since they're owned by NBC. They went after it in Chicago, NBC Chicago, and uh, it was lost in the archives. It was lost. Wow. Lost in the archives. So they, they actually had to call me, and I had a FedEx, my copy, which is not a great copy. And that's what they used for the end of Paranormal Witness. And, and that's the, what's on YouTube was your copy? copy of my copy. A uh, copy of your copy. Yeah, apparently uh, a few people I've given it to and, and one of them put it out there. I, I did not put it out there. And one of them even did a promotional job on one of them. There's, I guess there's two copies of it out there. Three. I think Chicago picked it off the Chicago blog. So it, it's out there now. During the uh, exorcism there was uh, a lot of sound of birds that just suddenly... Yeah, I was going to ask about the birds because, yeah. uh, you know, they, they make it appear pretty dramatic in the in the program. What was it What was it with the birds on that? It was pretty dramatic, actually. You can hear it uh, on the YouTube video and uh, the sound man, they were not able to filter them out. And it was something that, you know, it, it, uh, there were a couple things in that YouTube video, but the birds was one of them. All of a sudden, it started with a cheap, you know, one little squeak of a bird and then two and then three and then four. And then it escalated to, because there were a thousand birds. Wow. The stop man was going nuts trying to uh, adjust the sound. And then my, my guess was they took it back to their studio and then they did what they could, but they were never able to make them go away. And what time of day was it? It was a, a clear day. I mean, it was a little bit overcast. There was no rain, no sound. And so I get a lot of questions about that. I get questions about Carol Simpson, but mm -hmm. she said uh, we felt a gust of wind from the open window. There was no open window. Because the sound man and the exorcist made all, they made sure everything was closed. And they, in fact, we had some NBC executives leave because the exorcist said once this begins, no one can leave. <laughs> well, that won't frighten anybody at all. <laughs> I was kind of, I thought it was humorous because they were acting like little kids, you know, at a carnival, until the exorcist, and this guy had a voice like James Earl Jones with an English accent. <laughs>
Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He had to sit on the Bible? Yeah, he was sitting on a Bible. Isn't that kind of disrespectful to the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was thinking of that. But I mean, he, was, he, he was frightened. He, he was, no one knew what was going to go on. And the whole ceremony lasted well, a couple hours. The medium, Joseph, the psychic, uh, he, he went into a trance, and, and uh, he scared the exorcist. I mean, the exorcist, his frame of mind is you don't go out of body. You're vulnerable. And they felt something was negative with that house. And Joseph was trying to channel somebody in the house. He said he channeled the old woman. And uh, we could see beads of sweat. We, could, we heard his voice change. And we saw the uh, desperation in the exorcist, William Joe Davis, telling Joseph, don't go that far. Don't come back, come back. I, I don't even know if that's on the uh, tape. But he kept saying, come back, don't go that far. And he was worried. So these two, had had they worked together before? Or was this kind of, they just came together for this this particular incident? I think they came together for this incident. What happened was Tom Valentine had written a book for, about Joseph P. Louise that was published in 1971. He was nationally known at that time. He was involved in the Manson thing and, and uh, making certain predictions. Uh, he was a very gifted man. I, I came to know him, and he was a very gifted man. Well, they came to the house, and they, they asked us if they could have the whole building empty one evening, and we gave them the building. And he went back, and I guess he wanted a priest to be included. And he knew a father, Joe Wood, who had a radio channel. So he went to Father Joe Wood and he said, will you do this with me? And I think what Father, I think he refused, the Catholics refused, much like my, my neighborhood agrees. And I think he recommended William Darrell Davis as a known exorcist. And uh, I think that was the first time they ever worked together. I know it was the last time they ever worked together. They knew they failed. Everybody kind of knew they failed. And Marsha and I, we just sort of, we felt our backs were to the wall. There was no other place to go. There was no reason to make everybody feel bad. So we told Carol Simpson, she kept calling, are you okay? And we told her everything's fine. I became close with the psychic Joseph Kelly. We learned a lot about uh, being if, if I were a gifted person today, I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I really still, man, oh man. People wanted to pick the horses and they wanted to the oh, yeah. and they, you know, auto numbers. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now you obviously, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear you, you're a good judge of character. H- how did you, how did you feel comfortable being able to accept him as as being gifted? I mean, you know, you, you mentioned some charlatans. What what do you feel helped you to be able to distinguish? Well, I think he was able to tell me things about myself. He was able to tell my wife things about herself. After being with us for a period of time, he, he uh, I, I was involved in one in a, in a little business at the time, and uh, he was doomed to fail. And he knew it, but he would. He was too kind to tell me. He just avoided. Whenever I asked him about, him, is this going to be a success? He would just avoid the subject, like <laughs> ignore it. He was a very, very kind man. But he did tell me that I'd be successful in my life. And he told me other things. And if you, if you were to get a copy of his book, which is out of print, and you may get it today, he mentioned things that in a book, and him and I talked about things that I just thought were wacko. I mean, sperm banks. And I just mean, one he mentioned. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Wow. <laughs> he talked about. Uh, Steel raining down on New York and, and two buildings. Twin Towers weren't even built yet. So he had the gift of prophecy. And uh, I got to know him very well. I mean, uh, at a drinking level, okay, so we stopped have a drink. <laughs> I, I asked him how things came to him, and he explained very intermittent. He can feel. He, he was able to feel things from p- things people own. So if you handed him your keys or your wallet or something, he could feel that. He'd get some various impressions. And I asked him, I said, what do you do to get no impressions? And he said, I try to be kind. That's all he could do. Or be honest. He was a very gifted man. So, Ed, what advice would you give to somebody who approached you with a, a similar problem? I mean, what, what's one thing you would want to tell people? Oh, get out. <laughs> 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 well, honestly, I think you guys all know most spirits are benign. Yes. And, and some travel, and it, but most of them aren't going to harm you. Today, I would pay attention to, much like I said in my, in my book, I, I'd pay attention. My wife and I are both sensitive, having lived in that situation for quite a while. So we did go to buildings and have been in buildings where we know that what's here isn't good. We don't know if it's out there to harm, but it's not good. It's not something we could live with. You get the ringing in the ears. You get the you know your little hairs on your arms going standing straight up. You get the chills. You get the feeling you're being watched. You feel a very 
Exactly. At least it did with our, us. And that really was the weakest period in our marriage. We wound up arguing about everything. And a lot of it was my own ego because being a, a young man and being having some, I, I mean, I was the first person in my family to ever own a building or a house or any or structure. I came from a family of apartment dwellers. So I was very proud. And this thing really burst my bubble. When I watched Paranormal Witness, we were, my whole family was here. The scene that brought me out, that brought out my emotions was the initial scene where he was looking at the building to buy it because it took me back to my hopes, my dreams, my optimism, and my comfort, my security. It was everything that I had wrapped into thinking that this is what I was going to achieve, and it got dashed, and it, it just became a, a constant aggravation. It almost ruined my marriage. And even after you moved out, your tenants were calling you and complaining about the arguing and the noise and... at the uh, uh, quick claim deed right now on Carl's iPad. Unbelievable. Yeah. Have you, I, I, I know a lot of people have probably asked you this question in, in other interviews or other venues. Uh, have you ever gone back to look at the place? Or did you just say, no, this is it? I went back once. It was about three years later. We were in the neighborhood. There was a tile place that's famous in the city there that has a bunch of tile, and I was buying some tile. And I turned down the street, and I went there, and uh, the house was really ill kept. The front outer door was off. Some people on the corner, gang types, doing graffiti. And Marcia was frightened. I mean, Marcia came from a different world than I came from in Chicago. It didn't frighten me. I uh, like out of the car and I told them what a nice job we're doing, painting. <laughs> I was just kind of curious about that because I don't know how I would react in a situation like that, but I probably wouldn't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be afraid to go back, but I wouldn't do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot. If that makes any sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it does. I need the money because I always get angry at people who uh, say, well, he, you know, he did his credit and he just did this for the money. If I wanted the money, I would have did it in 1972. Uh, when, every, when the iron was hot and everybody wanted a story. Today, you know, it takes me, uh, I got to sell 13 ebooks to pay for a free book that I sent out to softcover. I got to sell 24 ebooks to send out a hardcover. There's no money to, you know, it's that the old, it's that, it's, I'm not castle, okay? <laughs> advances. I'm just happy to be read, and I'm 
listed there too. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're a great help to people, and it, it's something, God, I wish we would have had in 1971. Yeah, at that time, we, you know, there weren't any real organized groups. It was just a bunch of freelancers. Well, you know, and, and also, you're, you're a great help to people as well, because in, in reality, what we're doing here now is just trying to share your story with others so we can help others, but the reality is, just by sharing your own personal experiences, you're, you're helping them actually in many ways that we cannot. Now, now, kind of in closing, I, I know I know we've spoken for a while here, and we, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, just one last thing, kind of looking towards the future. I know uh, you, you mentioned your wife, Marsha, has has said that her story hasn't gotten told really. Now, I've heard she's got plans to create the sequel. Are you? Are, are, is there any way you can uh, give us a sneak peek as to? What kinds of things she wants to include in there that just did not get included in, in your story so far? Oh, certainly. I didn't tell her story. But they want to know how, how did she exist. I mean, she, she had this fortress in her kitchen and the door open, and she had certain things she experienced that, honestly, she probably hasn't told me everything, and I don't really want to know because it, it honestly makes me feel bad. I've always taken great pride in, in protecting my family and being able to, to stand between them and any type of harm, and that was the one time in my life when I could and I still feel very emotional at times about that. But I will interview her. I will write that portion of the book, starting from when she first saw the building. Mm-hmm. How I whisked her up the stairs to try to avoid Myra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, my brother, I, my, my real brother, uh, his name is the used. I'm using uh, my, my deceased brother's name in the book because my real brother didn't want to be portrayed like he was. Uh, uh, I mean, Myra nearly made him pee his pants. <laughs> <laughs> but the real chapters that knocked me out of my chair was Dan, Dan White, and what happened between him and his wife and the activity in his apartment was far beyond ours. I mean, it would unreal his tapes, it would steal his, move his tools, it touched him, it touched her. Uh, his wife was tormented. I mean, yeah, they heard the arguing and they heard, we shared certain, certain activities, but there were way more activities. You know, he, yeah, he had the swinging chandelier. They have so many more things. He's going to eventually, he's had a string of bad luck. He's, he does high-level surveillance, actually, some for the government. So he has a very important job. But recently he had some health problems in his family. So his father-in-law passed, and then his brother-in-law got ill and passed and, uh, recently. He's going to come down here, and I don't think he knows what I'm going to put him through as a, as a writer. <laughs> forward to reading that. Um, On a related note, you said that in your book that Myra accused you of breaking into her apartment and moving her stuff around? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and she accused Marsha, too. She accused us of moving her furniture, putting cigarettes out in her coffee. Crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, but I I attributed all the lunacy during that period that she was there. I, I didn't think anything paranormal was going on during the time that she was there. I just thought she was nuts. If anything scared me, she scared me because I figured she's real. She can, she can light the house on fire. She can do, uh, do damage. Did, did you ever see her take her dog outside? No, and, and I, I just posted that on my website as a question because she, we never saw her. When Marsha and I thought about it, I mean, it was not like she stayed in the forefront of our mind, but we never saw her leave the building. We never, she never let the dog out of the building. And even then with our clashes, and there were many more clashes that her and I had that are in my book, that dog never acknowledged me. So he would just be on her shoulder biting at her, her nasty, filthy hair. <laughs> and voice, I could raise my voice and that dog would not acknowledge me. Strangely, when she moved out, they did a nice job and they did clean the place up and sweep and everything else. But there was no evidence that a pet had ever been there. I was just about to ask that. <laughs> I also found that very strange. And, you know, I'm finding it strange 40 years later because none of the deaths in the book. But no, we that dog never made a sound, never, uh-huh. never barked. No dog poop, nothing, no scratches, I mean, nothing, huh? Nothing. No stains on the floor. It had wood, you know, old floors, wooden plank floors, and uh, zero. So, but, like, you know, when I met Dan, he said he had an afghan. And I said, you had an afghan, a dog. And I said, I never saw you have a dog. He said, well, it was only there for four or five days. He said, it took off. He said, one night, I guess he had a growling situation where the dog saw something, scared the heck out of the dog. And the next morning, he let it out in the backyard to do its business, and it took off. And 
two of your own dogs did that too. Yeah, and I lost two. But Kitty, I mean, Kitty sustained two 20 foot drops. Whether she was dropped or set down, I'd like to think she was set down because I never found her damage other than the uh, second time there was a little bit of blood by her nose. But you can't drop a cat 20 feet on the concrete. And uh, Kitty lived to be 17 years old. It was a great pet. Wow. In fact, the psychic wanted to buy her. <laughs> she was going to talk to her. I wanted to buy her. He thought that, that she was really attuned because she had a chair in the front room, in our front room. It was her throne, velvet chair. And she was perfectly litter box trained. We had her since she would come running out of the front door hissing like, like she was, you know, about to get into a fight. And one day, it was, we were only there about two, three months, I want to say. It was sometime after Myra left. All of a sudden, Kitty peed on this belt chair <laughs> and then never went back in the front room again. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I think I speak for a lot of people when I say thank you for putting yourself out there and sharing your experiences. I think everyone who gets a chance to read your book and speak with you, I think it's really impossible to come to any conclusion other than that you're a genuine and sincere person with a heart of gold. Uh, please give our best to your wife and family. We hope that despite your busy schedule, you get some uh, good quality time with the grandkids this holiday season. And certainly if you... Uh, Come out here to San Diego. Uh, you definitely need to look us up because uh, we'd love to love to take you around town and and um, and and say hi to you when you come on out. Oh, I'd, I'd love to meet you guys, and, and you should know that you are doing a great service to people. Because I I just wish there were groups like yours that would have told us, "No, you're not crazy." In 1971. No, we we appreciate that. And for everyone listening, Ed's book is available at Barnes and Noble. It's available on Amazon. Be sure to check out his website at www.edwinbecker.com as well as his post-episode commentary that's available at www.scifi.com. I want to thank everyone for listening. Good night and stay curious. One, one last thing, if you yes. can throw it in there, is that uh, my daughter gifted me with a, a True Haunting website. Oh, okay. Oh, oh wow. Mm-hmm. Exciting. TrueHaunting.com, and uh, it's got media news, it's got uh, all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. Very good. Truehaunting.com. We'll, we'll make sure to get the word out. And we'll link it to our website if that's okay. Uh, absolutely. Anything would be wonderful. Writers want to be read. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you so much, Ed. It was, such, it was such a pleasure to talk with you today. God bless you all and have a wonderful holiday. Yes. Thank you, you Ed. Too. You too. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. We'll be in touch. <laughs> bye bye. All right. All right take care. Bye. Bye. This has been a production of Pacific Paranormal Investigations, a proud TAPS family member based in San Diego, California. Pacific Paranormal Investigations is a volunteer organization of investigators and researchers seeking to assist those who are troubled or curious about experiences they suspect are paranormal. PPI's services are completely free of charge, and our investigations extend beyond San Diego County to the greater Southern California area. With commitment to our clients and dedication to our peers in the field of paranormal research, we take great pride in our PPI model. Investigate, evaluate, educate. For more information about our mission and our investigation protocols, please visit our website at www.pacificparanormal.com. Visit us on Facebook.